Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this session uh, where we are going to talk about how Electronic Arts modernized its data platform with Amazon EMR. My name is Arturo Bayo. I am the data and analytics specialist for our strategic customers at AWS. And I've got the pleasure of be sharing the stage today with uh, Shivika Verma, who is the principal product manager at Amazon EMR, and with Alex Ignatius, uh, who is the senior director for data and analytics engineering at Electronic Arts, who was also the executive sponsor for the migration project that we are going to share with you all this afternoon. But before diving deeper into EA's story, uh, let's reflect briefly why, about why customers are modernizing their data platforms. The fundamental reason is because the total amount of data that we are capturing, generating, copying, and consuming globally is growing very, very rapidly, reaching over 180 zettabytes in 2025, according to some analysts' reports. That is a growth rate of 10 times more data every five years. So since most of us here today are builders, right, if we want to design a data platform for our organizations that can last potentially for, let's say, 10, 15 years, right, that means that we need to design that data platform so that it can scale 1,000 times from where we are today, according to those growth rate numbers. Now, building for that scale is not easy, right? It brings some challenges across multiple dimensions that you need to consider, such as high cost when multi-year commitments on hardware, software, or support fees are in place. And this is even exacerbated when you've got compute and storage tightly coupled, um, or operations and manage management overhead that also tends to grow at the same pace as the data platform. And there is some times where the data platform itself cannot scale because it cannot cope with the amount of data, processes, or even people that are using the data platform now. New people uh, using the data platform bring in new requirements such as machine learning or um, data sharing or self-service. So um, when customers look at you know, solutions to modernize their data platform, they um, they want a solution that can address all these challenges. And one of the solutions that customers are looking at uh, is uh, Amazon EMR. And who better to tell you more about why than Shivika, the principal product manager for the service. Over to you, Shivika. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shivika Verma, and I'm part of the Amazon EMR product management team. And today I want to talk to you a bit about Amazon EMR and the value that EMR brings to our customers. So first, what's Amazon EMR? EMR is an industry-leading cloud big data solution for petabyte scale, data processing, interactive analytics, and machine learning using open source frameworks such as Apache Spark, Apache Hive, HBase, Hoodie, and Flink. EMR is 100% compliant to open source APIs, which means you don't need to change your application code when you come to EMR. With EMR, you can run petabyte scale um, analytics at half the cost of on-premise solutions and over 3x faster than standard Apache Spark. EMR makes it easy to create, operate, and scale big data environments by automating time-consuming tasks such as provisioning capacity and tuning clusters. With EMR, you can create a cluster and provision one, hundreds, or thousands of compute instances um, to process data at any scale. EMR can manage the cluster size for you to scale up or down depending on your utilization, and you only pay for what you use. EMR decouples compute and storage, allowing you to scale each independently. For storage, you can take advantage of tiered storage of Amazon S3, and for compute, you can take advantage of EC2 spot instances that can save you up to 80% of the cost of on-demand instances. EMR enables interactive analytics for data scientists and analysts through EMR Studio and deep integrations with um, SageMaker Studio, allowing you to visualize, build, and debug applications easily. EMR offers multiple deployment models. With EMR and EC2, you have access to a broad range of compute instances in the cloud, um, allowing you to optimize for price performance. 
customers can bring their Spark workloads to EMR along with container applications using Elastic Kubernetes Service, or EKS. With EMR serverless, you can run petabyte scale applications without having to manage or operate a cluster. And if you want the benefits of managed services in EMR, but need to keep your equipment in an on-premise environment, then um, AWS outposts are also an option. EMR um, runs directly against your data stored in an S3 data lake, which means you don't need to move or transform your data when you come to EMR. And because EMR runs against S3, you can have multiple clusters operating on the same data. So next I want to touch a bit about a bit on how customers use EMR. Customers use EMR to build data lakes as part of their modern data architecture for scalable data analytics. This can include things such as change data transfer, uh, change data capture, or ingesting streaming telemetry events. Customers use EMR to query petabytes of data in batch or real time using open source frameworks such as Spark, uh, Presto, and Hive. Customers come to EMR from expensive solutions. Cost savings on EMR are not just support costs. There's also savings to be had on hardware acquisition, personnel, and maintenance costs. Essentially, with EMR, you can create a cluster um, in minutes without having to do any of the typical management activities that you previously had to do. Customers use EMR in conjunction with um, our studio and SageMaker to transform, analyze, and prepare large quantities of data as part of their data science and machine learning workflows. Um, and lastly, customers use notebooks uh, to build um, uh, to build big data applications um, and leverage other AWS analytics services. So lastly, I just want to touch a bit on the areas where EMR is continuously innovating. One area where we're constantly innovating in is performance. And this is because we want to make sure that EMR is the best place for you to run your Spark workloads, as well as workloads on other open source frameworks such as um, Presto and Hive. In addition, there are four main themes where we continue to, uh, to innovate. The first is uh, cost and performance. In addition to the um, performance improvements that we've made in our runtime, uh, we focus on two main areas, compute optimizations and cluster management policies. For compute optimizations, um, while it depends on the number and types of uh, compute instances you deploy and on-demand offers um, low rates, you can further cost optimize by purchasing reserved instances or spot instances. EMR provides cluster management policies, which provide configuration options that allow you to um, configure things such as how your cluster is terminated, automatically or manually. This can further uh, reduce your costs by allowing your clusters to only run for the time needed. The next area I want to call out is ease of use. And the main innovations here are in EMR Studio, EMR Studio is an integrated development environment that allows um, data, engineers and, um, uh, data engineers and scientists to deploy code easily. It's a fully managed application uh, with single sign-on, Jupyter notebooks, automated infrastructure provisioning, and uh, job diagnosis. The next area I want to call out where we continue to innovate is transactional data lakes. And the main innovations here are in the ingestion, querying, and administration for the creation and management of data lakes. And lastly, security. EMR has a comprehensive set of features across isolation, authentication, and authorization. And EMR enables you to work with data that is encrypted at rest and in transit. So with that, next up, we'll get a first-hand view of how customers are modernizing with Amazon EMR. And this will be presented by Alex Ignatius, who is a Senior Director of Data and Analytics at Electronic Arts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shivika. Pleased to be here. So coming to the meat of the presentation, I'm here to talk about our journey with, the, with EMR, or in other words, you can call it as where rubber met the road. So welcome to Electronic Arts in the first place. If any of you have any of your teenage children, you would definitely know like what Electronic Arts does. So we are a gaming company. We make games for various platforms, including Xbox, uh, PlayStation, um, and every other PC online, every other 
uh, a game playing platform that you can imagine. The, what you see here is a makeup of what Electronic Arts is. I mean, we have plenty of studios all over the world making different genre of games. In other words, we exist to inspire the world to play with 20, 20, uh, 20 plus studios distributed all over the world making flagship titles like RFC or Battlefield or Madden or Sims, many of them that you would have heard. So naturally we cater to a very large global audience, very large global audience of different seasonality of uh, games, um, uh, games and game releases, and all the data flowing in from uh, each and every one of our studios. How do, we, how do we handle this? Because each of these studios and each of these games function pretty much like I always used to say, company of companies. They have a unique culture to themselves, and they have a unique architecture, they have a unique way of really doing things. Everything is, a, is on their own. How do we really bring the data together? Because if the data is going to be siloed, that's going to be a very big challenge. And that's where we come in. We are EA Digital Platform, and I belong to the vertical of data and AI. I have a couple of my colleagues here with me uh, as well. Our job is to deliver platform as a service. We don't want each and every one of them building a data platform on their own and doing every nuts and bolts before they could even consume the data and make meaningful uh, business decisions. So we are part of the EA Digital Platform team and we offer platform uh, as a service. Now, from data acquisition all the way to collection, to processing, and sometimes summarizing and delivering to our customers, we take care of all of that and this includes naturally all the compliance management and all the um, uh, enriching, uh, the summarizing, and making sure that we are all the GDPR compliance included, everything is uh, taken care. In terms of consumption, we have all sorts of consumers, like our personas include uh, a producer could be needing that data, or a data engineer could be needing that data, or a game artist might be needing that data, or a business for a business decision, the sales, every, you, you think about a persona, we have all of them in each and every one of these game units. So there is a common language that they speak across. At the same time, there is a unique language to each and every one of these games and the studios. So that's where we come in as a central data platform. We try to really unify everything that's related to that common language, data language, that all of them speak. You know, I, I jokingly used to say, um, I mean, all of us being data professionals, you are either already in a data storm, or you are about to get into one, or you are, about, or you are getting out of one, one or the other. And by the time you thought you have solved it for the next few years, here comes another surprise. That's where we were constantly and continuously. Now, with one central data platform team, we acquire all this data. It's, it's like tens of billions of rows per day, multiple tens of billion, billions of rows per day uh, that we collect. And we as a team put together, sanitize that data, make that data readily available. Either you want to consume in the raw form, or you want to consume in a summarized form, or you want to consume either directly through an API, or you just want a raw data copy of it right from storage, or you want to really consume it through a BI tool or an ETL tool or whichever way that you want. We support all of it. So from EA, one central data platform, on the left side, what you see is your EA digital platform, and we are part of it, data and AI. And on the right side, hundreds of data teams. Just because we have one central data team, that does not mean each of those games or everyone totally depend on us. That's not the way it is. Each and every one of our uh, games and game teams and studios, they have their own data team, all the way from maybe a small number of data engineers, all the way up to data scientists and AI engineers, everyone who consume and uh, use this data on a day-to-day -day basis. So from a user perspective, a, mul a, a variant uh, type of uh, data sets that we need to cater to, variant type of personas that we need to uh, cater to, and naturally various type of problems that we need to really uh, cater to as well. Now, with this many studios, tens of terabytes of data, uh, tens of terabytes of telemetry data flowing in every single day. Thousands of ETLs of all uh, velocity in nature, uh, real time, near real time, um, um, batch, mini batch, every aspect of uh, velocity, you can think about thousands of ETLs streaming in every day, and 
dozens and dozens of petabytes of data accumulated. It's a large data platform. And that's where this leads to, all of this leads to the, the volume, the velocity, and the real time, or mini batch, and everything leads to proliferation of tech in the sense that I wouldn't call it proliferation, but kind of an organic growth over a period of 10, 11 years. Like, they were unique individual problems that we're trying to solve, a tool or technology helped. They were common mass problems that we were trying to solve across the studios, a particular area really helped. So our platform has grown over a period of last 10 plus years with a bunch of vendor stack and a whole bunch of open source stack. It's a combination of both with which we deliver what we deliver. So as you look at this picture, this is where I really don't know how to put it because this is not, uh, this is where we were, okay? So this is where we, we originally were because we have already migrated, we are already in production. Our current state solution with EMR is already in production, delivering, up and running. So this is where we were, the legacy uh, state. Just, if you look at the left side, let me, let me start with um, uh, the left side, where, where, the, where our data emerges. As I said, each and every one of your kiddos as they really pick up that controller and push a button, we get, a, we, we get data. I mean, you know, all our, our partners and their services working synchronously to really bring in that data, either our internal game servers or game backends or the game clients, and then our first party providers, like for example, Sony or Microsoft or even Amazon or uh, Meta or anyone from anywhere this data could emerge. And we have a robust uh, even collection service which um, uh, seamlessly collects all that data and dumps that into uh, S3. Now, once, we are, uh, once the data is in S3, then our scheduler really picks it up, and where we had a huge data processing platform at that, spot, uh, at that place. Our Hadoop, Hive-based, uh, with, with about close to 500 plus nodes that we had at one time, and then three plus petabytes of HDFS space, and um, then 2,000 plus ETLs really grinding at it, actually. And this, is, this was our uh, legacy uh, state, per se. Now, well, for, for orchestration, we, have a, um, uh, we had uh, Uzi, and then we had Hive Metastore for our metadata, and then our typical normal monitoring, um, health monitoring portals like uh, Slack or email notifications, or we have a DevOps internal portal where we had all that. Coming to the right side of the picture, which is our consumption stack, where we, as I mentioned, we, did, we deliver data in several forms to several destinations. I mean, you can just subscribe to a data set to really get your data to your preferred destination, or we make the data available in either Redshift or Snowflake, or Big, there are BigQuery, or so many platforms where the consumers are, and we don't dictate this is where you need to access, rather they have the option of having the data delivered to the endpoints, or what we call as sinks, where they really want to have data. We do have an in-house Querying mechanism also, it's a Trino-based um, uh, in-house uh, environment, what we are built called Pond, where customers can access any of those data sets directly out of um, uh, Pond as well. And we have a whole rich set of APIs through which the customers can consume as well, because one of the use cases of data consumption is our live services. Our live services are directly game integrated. Sometimes when you go, go into a game, when you are in a messaging service inside the game, the small pop-ups that you see and the images that you see, that is directly rendered from the data platform. So we have a live services component of our data platform for which the data need to be rendered as well. So we have a rich set of um, uh, APIs and few, uh, several operational DBs as well. So this is overall um, our, our current state existing, uh, uh, sorry, our legacy uh, platform, what we had. Now the question could be, so it looks clean enough, neat enough, what's your problem? Why, why do you want to really radically make over this whole platform and why? So as I mentioned, we always are either entering into or we are in or we are getting out of a data storm. I mean, all of us who have been in this industry for a decade plus, at least for the three decades plus that I've been there, that is the reality actually. Now, first of all, what is our first, the, our first challenge was, legacy and aging stack. Too many components accumulated over a period of a decade plus. The platform emerges over and over, over and over, and always we have this, I mean, uh, necessary evil called the backwards compatibility, right? You never get to make over things that easily. 
anything and everything that goes to production, every service, needs to be backwards compatible. So slowly but steadily, too many um, components in, in the stack, a lot of interdependencies and versions, and very, very slow-paced upgrades and paces. To, to an extent, we even, I mean, obviously, AWS has evolved in, in this entire journey in this period as well. And we had some of our dependencies built into the AMI versions that we were using. So it's, it's kind of very tightly coupled and uh, with a lot of components in it. And the number, that naturally increases the number of data ops in your environment. So that is our, one of our major uh, challenge. Then effective auto scaling. With this many components really making it, you may be able to auto scale one, one piece of your stack, but not the other piece. I mean, how good is that? At the end of the day, the customer SLA has not changed in any way. Data delayed is data denied. So in that kind of a, we needed kind of a central mechanism where we can handle critical things such as retention, access, our access control, our provisioning. We needed kind of a central mechanism. Making that work in, with this many versions and variations of technology and technology stack components was really a Herculean challenge. And then very importantly, Sometimes our customers even, they don't even need a faster SLA, but they need a consistent SLA. Hey, tell me every day the data is going to be delayed for an hour. I'm okay with it. But don't tell me today it arrived on time and tomorrow it arrived later and the following day uh, sooner. That, this cycle repeating, our inability to predict uh, the RSLAs was another major driver for us. And then, I, as I mentioned, very tightly coupled architecture some of our AMI dependencies, instance dependencies, and needless to say, heavy data movement between HDFS and S3. As I mentioned in the architecture slide, we had three plus petabytes of HDFS storage with minimal retention. No data ever sits in our HDFS environment more than seven days. And most of the data is barely a couple days or three days. That's how we keep the data. So it's more of a process place where we receive all of our telemetry and we do heavy lifting, all the processing after which the data really gets into uh, S3 for consumption. At that point onwards, the consumption really uh, starts, which means there is terabytes and terabytes, tens of terabytes of data movement between HDFS and S3 every single day. Once the processing is complete, then we had backup mechanisms that will back up the data into S3, then it goes through one more level of processing, and then we get into our, each and every one of it is a hop that takes considerable amount of time. Last but not the least, as I mentioned, by the time you thought you solved the problem, there is 10 other waiting for you already. That's the typical nature of the data world. So our increasing business demand, our data used to double in the past, have, I mean, I'm a long timer with EA, uh, so there, there, there were times when every five years your data pretty much doubles. Now it's almost every year or every other year your data pretty much doubles. So the increasing business demand is that, I mean, the amount of data that they want, uh, real time, near real time, mini batch, batch, the demand is continuously increasing. And naturally with this kind of a stack, as well as this many components, as well as this much of business demand, it's like, it's increasing operations overhead. Out of the Yen hops that it takes, out of Yen technologies that are involved, even one single piece of it can really kill your SLA. And if it is not this tech this time, it is something else next time. One or the other. So the increasing operations overhead, our, our dev investment, dev engineering investment uh, was kind of being balanced or overthrown with uh, the um, operations overhead. And naturally, that leads to cost and cost management challenges, everything. And the file formats or the tech versions, everything. So we needed a next generation platform. Next generation platform that will help us, first of all, the bottom line that was given to us is that seamless. Absolutely seamless because we have games launching throughout the year. It's not that, hey, we have a launch season. Yes, our, our sports properties like the NFL or the uh, football club FC, they have specific time of launch, but they are, there are a slew of other games, especially our mobile properties that continuously launch all through the year. And they don't wait for, a, okay, this is a downtime, that is a downtime, we didn't have that luxury at all. From the current state to future state, it has to be absolutely a seamless transition for us. We didn't have a no downtime bottom line. And then, 
handle mixed and diversified workloads. You know, sometimes we optimize quite a lot for the reads, sometimes we optimize quite a lot for the writes, and for us it is like all through the day we have demand that's commonly and continuously flowing through us. So mixed workload scenarios with a central data catalog was our vision. And then optimize our DevOps, I already spoke to it a little bit before, reduce our operations overhead, and have an effective CI-CD mechanism, um, and then um, enhance the monitoring and alerting services. And last but not the least, this is the fundamental thing that our customers expected from us, is predictable SLAs. Predictable SLAs and guarantees that we can sign up for, that they can sign up for, because there are multiple levels of customers. Like, for example, the C-level suite expects a different kind of data set. The engineering expects a different kind of data set. Studio producers expect a different kind of data set and different SLAs. All of them need to be brought in together. That's where we turn to EMR. We wanted it to be as fully managed as possible, so a fully managed big data processing platform. The key thing for us is that that leverages that supports a, a wider range of open source frameworks for us to, because as I mentioned earlier, our platform in the legacy state itself, quite a bit open source plus vendor stack. So that open source support was very uh, important uh, to us, like, um, and say, uh, uh, Spark or Hive or Flink or Iceberg, all of them, the support was very critical because we just can't restart over newly somewhere, actually. And our platform is predominantly built on AWS. We are a multi-cloud environment. We are present in all the three clouds. Some form of our services or other are running in all the three clouds. But in this case, predominantly our platform is built on AWS. Um, um, AWS. So EMR really nicely fits in there, where it fits into the whole ecosystem of um, our existing platform, actually. then looking for quantifiable uh, SLA improvements, and uh, very importantly, the next point I'll also be talking about a little bit later, the resource isolation. In our legacy state, we had a queuing mechanism whereby all the jobs in a particular queue really share all the resources, but that did not really work for us, actually, because one game could pump in. Sometimes it could even be a bug or it could be a bot or something like that. That could pump in enormous amount of data that will impact every other job in the same queue. I mean, a queue level optimization or SLA uh, guarantees or resource isolation is not enough for us. We needed a job level isolation. And spot instances um, are uh, incentive for us, like from a cost management perspective. Compute and storage, scale, ability to scale both of them independently. And then, uh, like, you know, a managed scaling. Because I want to be cautious there. Somebody went and ran a select star query. On a, on a petabyte size of, a, on a, a 10 terabyte size of a table, and then for that, I end up scaling up and paying for it. We, do, we don't want those kind of things to happen because the analyst community churns over continuously and constantly. A newer analyst who doesn't know the size of the game or the size of the table or size of the data could easily kill her. So we wanted a managed scaling without the defined parameters, how we can really scale up and scale down very effectively, something that we were looking for. And I'll also talk about the t-shirt sizes, uh, how we came about um, in a little bit later uh, in my presentation as well. Now, with that, where did we end up? What is our, um, our current state? Where are we currently functioning? I'm not going to be spending much time on the left side because nothing much has changed uh, there, actually, um, except that from Perforce we went into uh, Git. Uh, other than that, on the left side, what I explained in the legacy, where our data originated and how we really bring that data in pretty much is uh, similar. Yes, of course, we are working on uh, newer collector, collecting, collection service mechanisms, acquisition mechanism constantly, but that will happen organically no matter what because our games keep growing and scaling. The critical difference, key difference is in the middle uh, part of it where uh, you see. So we, we came up with this decoupled architecture that is flexible enough for us to pick our software and the versions of it, um, as flexible as possible. And at the end of the day, they need to be talking to each other in a seamless fashion, whether you are delivering the data to Redshift or you are delivering the data to Snowflake, each and every one of them really following a unique way to connect and collect. That's not the way we wanted it. So it's kind of a very decoupled architecture that's very flexible to plug and play, whether it is a tech to acquire or a tech to process or a tech to consume, 
We wanted all of it to be seamless, working with each other. Then the next thing is that you may see that large, extra, extra large, medium, and kind of a thing. So this, first of all, this my, let alone the uh, uh, processing part of it, this migration was, frankly, when we worked with our AWS partners, they were quite puzzled at, are you really going to do it? Thousands of jobs, three petabytes of HDFS, one year time scale. We have seen companies making, taking three plus years to really deliver this kind of a, a thing. There, were, there was a lot of internally and um, um, also there was a lot of skepticism around it. And we had an army of engineers going at it. And we can't afford to let each of them make a decision on, okay, what instance type would really work for me? What is the compute demand? And what is the storage demand? What is the IO demand? And what is the SLA that I need to, if we are going to take that kind of an approach, it's going to take not three years. It could take even five years for us. So we heavily, heavily invested. I'll speak about it a little bit more later as well. We heavily invested in the planning and architecture and preparation stage where we had t-shirt size of clusters that already predefined. That all we had a we had we profiled all our jobs. We had those defined so that when it comes to the engineer, as long as he knows about his job, what he wants, that's enough. And then. He, we will have something equivalent for him to really pick up a t-shirt size of a, um, a configuration and then spin it up and then run it up. And that's how we had, because our storage layer also, it's, it's intelligent tiering on S3. So we had end-to-end, -end, we wanted it to be as decoupled as possible, but at the same time, we, wa we wanted as minimal decision-making at every stage of our stack where the data passes through. If each and every one of them are going to take time to really decide, even one wrong decision is going to cost us quite dear and near uh, in terms of our external delivery. So what you see is that um, a large, large XLR uh, uh, medium is basically the type of clusters, type of instances with specific reasons and profiling of our jobs that we really picked. Then we switched from Uzi to Airflow for, from our orchestration perspective and with, a, with our uh, my metadata sitting in uh, DynamoDB there. From observability stack at the top, the existing mechanism continued. We added uh, Amazon CloudWatch, Prometheus, and Grafana to our stack for monitoring, not only monitoring post live. We wanted this, there was enormous amount of testing and iteration that we did at each and every one of those stages. How long it takes to spin up uh, a cluster, then how much of uh, compute it is using, how many nodes are, how many instance are, uh, instances are being used, how much memory being used, are we optimally using it? All of this need to be continuously tracked for us to make sure that we are on the right trajectory. Otherwise, at the end of the year or end of the thing, I can't afford to really go and say at that point, oh, like, you know, these number of jobs are not really meeting our goal. We are breaking our bank. We can't afford that. So we needed very close observability right in the, from the get-go all the way up to uh, delivery. Then the alerts to our Slack and email are the same. And then the consumption stack also, uh, the key part is that uh, AWS Glue. As I mentioned, we were missing that interconnectivity across platform, across the platform. And you know, so many, not only because of that, Uzi, it's not just that Uzi was not capable or anything, this is where the version dependency also comes in. Some of our stack versions, including Uzi, were really old and that really doesn't support it. So we use this as an opportunity in parallel, that is a huge project that happened in parallel to EMR migration itself, where we completely upgraded, our, we moved into AWS Glue, of, and uh, for the repository, and we, EMR took full advantage of it on the other side as well. And on the right side, you see the uh, delivery stack. And all of this done, that is the very important part. All of this done in a seamless manner, meaning our legacy stack and the current and the future stack, we're constantly talking to each other and doing the jobs. The reason being, they were two approaches, which leads to the next one. With thousands of jobs accumulated, I had two options in front of me. One is take workflow by workflow. A workflow has got 10 jobs or 20 jobs, and take each of them, move it end to end, perfect, please, clean, peaceful, go to the destination and then walk away. Ideally, that's what I would love to do, but that is not practical in our case. First of all, for a platform of this age, ironing out each of the interdependencies and then finding out all the associated objects, all the libraries, and all the um, operators, everything, and then move them together in one shot with all the validation, we would be in this for many, many years. 
So that was, that was a very challenge. It's a right way to do it, but unfortunately, that was not an option for us. So the next option is basically job by job. And even in that job by job, we went by the impact rather than the mere size. Thousands and thousands of jobs. It's a typical, instead of 80-20, I would say 70-30 rule. 70% 70 of the jobs really delivered the 100% of uh, hit what we wanted to really get. So, so sorry, 30% of the jobs. So the smaller set of jobs, which are really heavy compute in nature, and which takes the juice out of the entire platform, we targeted them and we moved them even there job by job. But the challenge with the job by job approach is that half of your workflow is running in the future state, half of your workflow is running in the legacy state. And these two need to constantly keep exchanging their status to make sure that the entire workflow doesn't fail and the customer is not disappointed um, uh, from a point of view, either not seeing what you should see or the data is super delayed. So this preparatory phase was very, very critical for us and we did that. So the job and ETL classification, kudos to my team, my whole org, in fact, they painstakingly sat and classified all the jobs into groups of jobs with a common compute profile, common storage profile, and common demands from every aspect, including the customer delivery, criticality of the data, all those aspects. I mean, if any of you are considering that kind of a migration thing, this is where you want to invest, even before you write a single line of code to do anything at all. I mean, if this phase is done for you, you pretty much have uh, you're well begun. That's what I would say. Our investment in this phase helped us so very much. And not only that, in this phase, we also invested quite heavily in not only the jobs classification aspect of it, but building frameworks so that it will be a rinse and repeat for anyone that comes after. Meaning, we needed a development framework. We needed a validation framework, testing framework. We needed a deployment framework because we don't want everyone going through the manual steps of all of this at a time. So rather, we, we invested in those frameworks and we, we, we made it as a kind of a literally a cookie cutter mechanism for our engineers so that they don't need to think a lot, manage a lot, just set this configuration. Here is your cluster that will spin up, and here is where you set your configuration for deployment and CI, CD. We made that, and so this is the phase where we really built those dev, test, and deploy frameworks as well, so that we can literally get into a factory model of several engineers really jumping in and then doing this entire work. Migration with zero downtime, I already mentioned. Backwards compatibility also, we have spoken about it. Observability was critical all through the migration for us, not just after uh, releasing it. And the, we, at this point, we kind of defined a kind of a development and migration strategy. Like, uh, with this many jobs, both in terms of the development, also in terms of the both in terms of the development as well as in terms of deployment. Once we did this whole classification, we classified them into a set of 12 waves. Into 12 waves, 12 group of jobs that are fully isolated in parallel development and deployment. Because doing it sequentially was not an option at all. So again, in the order of criticality, this is where I do not have that big of an engineering shop because I have a live platform of tens of petabytes to sustain while we are really building this, uh, transitioning into the new. So this is where we took full advantage of AWS ProServe, and we had them partner with us in terms of whole development activity so that we can focus on validation, testing, deployment, migration, because my people know my, da uh, my data really well. Like, you know, it's, it's very difficult to expect somebody external to really come in and get that, give that, bring that kind of uh, expertise. So we focus more on really testing, validation, deployment, making sure that the um, uh, previous stack and current stack are producing same output, while AWS ProServe, on the other hand, wave by wave, they built and developed and deploy, uh, they developed and then work with us to really uh, hand it off and things like that. And we were, um, I mean, as I mentioned, within a year, we wanted to really get all this done. And even within that year, we had to take into account every single game launches that we had. So many freezes and so many um, uh, deep freezes in the entire year, we had to really take all of that uh, into account to deliver that. So with the evaluation and then migration assessment, and um, once we built all those frameworks and everything, the waves were completely iterative. We, we finished development, 
we go into the deployment stage, then my internal team takes over, they start really validating, verifying, and then pushing into production, comparing with the previous and current state, the next wave gets developed coming in, like a complete factory model, we were doing it end to end. So the first period that is January through March, pretty much you see is our framework investments, our architecture investments, and then the following year, um, we, we delivered what we promised for. This is how we executed the project overall. So the class job classification process, as I mentioned, 2,000 plus jobs, like, you know, what are our production ETLs, like that make up what percentage of it? Subscriptions are nothing but our data delivery mechanisms. Which are the sinks and which are the destinations to which the data really gets delivered? And uh, those are our, some, some, somebody could be subscribing through an API. Somebody could have a regular job that's running, pushing data out somewhere. Somebody could be really pointing their dashboard itself directly to us anyways. So then our compliance like GDPR extracts and other things. And then S-Test is nothing but our pre-prod environment, our pre-prod environment ETLs. Um, and then we also use this opportunity to retire a whole bunch of jobs so that, I mean, uh, how many times you get to look back 10 years and see what's really uh, uh, required. So we use this opportunity to do that as well. Now, as I mentioned, the t-shirt uh, sizes, all that our engineers had to do is what is on the left side for you. We made 20 plus cluster types and instance types that are readily made available to them. And each of them have got predefined configurations underneath. What is the instance type? What is the EBS size? What is, is it on demand or spot? All those are predefined and predecided for them. They don't need to break their heads. Just know your data well. Know your job well, job behavior well. As long as you know that, they can pick one of it and 25 plus um, uh, different predefined configurations and spin up your instance and then uh, go from there. So the, the framework enables config driven, um, uh, conf to be config driven for us. That really enabled us uh, for that, and it expedited our transition quite a bit. And also, very importantly, this limited our cost exposure. Because if each engineer is going to make an instance choice, consider you, you, are, you are tuning for performance, you are tuning for SLA, I could throw a bunch of hardware at it and get the same SLA done, but I've broken the bank. Or it could happen vice versa. Now, this, this predefined mechanism really helped us to contain cost and manage this whole migration in a, in a better way, manage this in a better way. And from our uh, job orchestration in our perspective, uh, while definitely on demand is something for which you come to EMR, it's really good and everything, but our challenge was that there are some of our jobs which are more frequent that run pretty much throughout the day. And if your job is be, you're going to be 10 minutes, and if it takes about seven minutes to spin up a EMR cluster, that defeats your whole purpose. You have already missed 70% of your SLA. So for that purpose, in order to mitigate that, we had uh, um, uh, long-running clusters in addition to the transient clusters. We kept it at minimum. It's 5% of our uh, clusters are really long-running uh, clusters. Now, this is where, as Shivika mentioned earlier, multiple jobs being able to be deployed onto the same cluster really helped us. So these jobs repeatedly running every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, or very frequently get deployed to the same cluster so that they will uh, continue running, while majority of our deployment is on um, uh, transient clusters. So data and metadata uh, integration, as I mentioned, uh, between the HDFS to S3 data movement, minimizing or removing it, is our really, really, we were doing a simple this CP after every time our job completes in HDFS, we really move it into S3. That data movement has completely is, is vanished now in the, in the sense that uh, EMR directly operates on S3 and EBS underneath. So we completely, we were able to eliminate that. And in terms of our metadata, um, um, uh, metadata integration, and at, so job by job approach, we made the metadata integration, our team did an awesome job in that actually, because we have Hive catalog in operation and we have a Glue catalog in operation. And we have current state, um, uh, our uh, stack in operation, we have legacy state, uh, state uh, stack in operation. When customer, our customers have a lot of their jobs in our platform itself, they are called self-serve uh, ETLs. And we have our own jobs, which are bridging, running across all of them. How do we really make sure we synchronize all of them, keep the catalog synchronized, and keep our data synchronized, keep our jobs running in a seamless fashion? All that was as a part of this, as I mentioned, AWS Glue played a big role for us. Like I said, that's a presentation of its own kind. 
we, there's a lot of cool and great work that I've done. One cool thing that I can talk about is that our query rewrite, because when the query fires up and the ETL fires up and the query is coming to the catalog, um, the customer doesn't know which catalog, uh, this table is in which catalog right now. Has it migrated to Glue or is it still in Hive? Or has it moved to the new job, moved to the new stack or still, the customer doesn't know any of it. We capture the query, we rewrite the query, we, added, we know where what resides, we rewrite the query and we send it so that we keep the entire migration seamless to our customers. Other migration considerations um, for you to keep in mind if you are considering anything like this, the UDF compatibility, like a lot of custom UDFs written over a period of time. So we carefully uh, evaluated how many of them we really need and why. And also in this period, there are a lot of native UDFs which already deliver the same function. We use that as a, um, unfortunately we did not have the luxury of, uh, we did not have the luxury of um, uh, really uh, rewriting everything from scratch, which would not really permit us. So I don't want to read through the entire slide. You can go, go through the small files issue, data validation, and EC2 instance availability, obviously the size of your cluster and all that. And idle clusters is something important because we want auto-terminate, and that really has a direct impact on your cost. And Snowflake integration, cluster sharing for multiple jobs to be deployed, all that is a very important consideration for our migration overall. So our migration waves that I already spoke about, the deployment waves at the bottom, how we track the development waves at the top. Like wave one, wave two, as it completes, it comes to the deployment. So at the deployment, pick a job, check your depend up upstream dependencies, resolve if needed, review the DAG YAML, and then check the ETL configs, fire up and deploy, create a, create a merge request, and then go and deploy. The what you see at the bottom is kind of rinse and repeat model, what we built, and what you see at the top is the development pipeline. Observability, native integration with CloudWatch, and simple integration with the Prometheus and the Grafana, and the overall SLA overview dashboard, which completely gives us at the finest grain. And this is one of the feedbacks that I've given to the AWS team, uh, EMR team this morning, where we want a connected ecosystem-wide depiction of how, how many instances, for how long they've been running, how much how is the compute usage, everything. These, in, these metrics are available, but they are available in bits and pieces all over the ecosystem. Some connected mechanism would really help us as customers to really go through this. And quite detailed um, uh, observ observability stack that we really put together. Last but not the least, like, you know, had it not been this new stack, it would have been very challenging for us to really deliver even the last year's holiday data volume. Last year's holiday data volume itself was more than double than what we actually anticipated. That's exactly where the job level isolation helped us. As you can see, our legacy state architecture had the um, uh, 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 queue level isolation, queue level resource isolation, meaning every job in the queue utilizes the same um, set of resources. Whereas if you look on the, si um, on the right side, it's completely the job level isolation so that one job doesn't end up impacting another job, one query doesn't end up impacting another query, and that's how th that was a huge, huge breakthrough for us really to be able to do that, that really uh, helped us. So our, not only our last holiday volume, this year, um, as you know, our FC launch saw one of the highest ever data volumes that we have ever received, and the stack stood strong. Uh, so in, in time, we really moved in and it really helped us quite a bit uh, from our, uh, just a glimpse of our data volumes from, from last year's snapshot, 113% year over year increase, and daily count 53% increase, our SLA improvements, well, one, in spite of that increase, more than expected, more than double increase, almost 90 minutes of SLA that we saved and we delivered with a 20% TCO reduction. Most importantly, what you see at the bottom, like, our SLA and delivery mechanism at the top and, this, and the uh, consistent line at the bottom, what our customers really asked for. What's next? Quite a lot on our plate. Uh, we are looking at everything from our um, uh, observability stack, iceberg, and then um, um, EMR serverless. There are several areas that we are actively looking to evolve the platform to the uh, next level. With that, I'll hand off to Arturo. Um, AWS partnership has been very vital and key to us to really go through this entire year. So while I have spoken about how it has gone for us, I let Arturo to talk about how it went forward from AWS perspective. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alex, for sharing this amazing story with all of us today and uh, for the close partnership that we 
uh, that you, all of you at Deltonica has had with, with us during all these years. Um, now, let me walk you through five lessons learned that we can generalize from this migration project that Alex just described that I hope you will find valuable if you are in a similar migration, migration journey. Um, the first tip, the first one is to understand the benefits of migrating, right? And you may think, well, this is obvious, right? But this is really about ensuring that you've got a business case for the migration, ensuring that you've got defined a success criteria for it, and that it's aligned with your business outcomes, with your business goals, or at least supporting them. For EA, for example, um, one of the main drivers for this migration was that cost should not scale linearly as the platform grows, right, as it was doing before. So um, that's one of, the, one of the things that you need to keep in mind as um, the tip number one. You need to make sure that you've got that um, uh, success criteria defined for the migration. Tip number two, deconstruct your environment into workloads. And this, is, this exercise is typically done in three steps. The first one is um, you classify your jobs into different groups, as Alex was talking about. EA, for example, classify their jobs into things like short-running ETLs, long-running ETLs, regulatory workloads, subscriptions, etc. But you can use other you know, more generic groups, such as machine learning training, uh, batch, real-time workloads, etc. That's the first thing. Now, once you do that, you need to identify the execution schedule and resource requirements for each of those groups so that it will help you identify areas for optimization. For example, uh, underutilized or overutilized time windows on your cluster. And the third step, once you get all that information, is to really find out what's the best target architecture for those groups of jobs. For example, you may decide to go with Amazon EMR on EC2 for some of those groups and uh, having a cluster of certain size and instance types. And you may decide to go with Amazon EMR uh, serverless applications with uh, some of those um, groups. Third tip is to build your own migration plan. Now, um, when you are considering a new technology, you typically start with a POC, right? So for a migration, when you're, a migra when you're migrating to a new technology, um, this is no different. You also start typically with a POC to select the technology. And once you select the technology, you typically want to do a more comprehensive assessment on the current environment. As Alex described, they did an, an assessment using AWS Professional Services. You can leverage uh, any of our uh, consulting uh, services partners as well or you can do an assessment by your own if you've got enough, enough resources. The idea is to, as with any migration, is to go live with the target system, right? In this case, EMR, and power off the previous system. And we see, in order to get to that point, we see customers taking two different approaches um, that I'm gonna briefly describe. The first one is what we call the parallel migration, the parallel strategy. In here, um, basically, you spin up a new environment that is a duplicate from the original system, and you start synchronizing data and processes uh, until both systems generate the same results. Now, you need some sort of business users or business validation, right, by the end users that guarantee, that validate that, that you know, th those results are, are really um, equal on, across both, both platforms. And at that point is when you can go live with EMR and then turn off the previous system. And the second approach is the incremental approach, which is the, e, the one that EA followed. In, in here, you basically create a new environment progressively as you migrate waves of workloads to production, to EMR. So what happens here is that over time, you will have all workloads running in production on EMR and nothing in the previous system. So you can simply turn off that uh, previous system once everything is migrated to, to EMR. The fourth tip is to uh, consider post-migration uh, optimizations. And this is especially relevant if you are doing a uh, lift and shift kind of migration, right? Um, things that Alex mentioned, like right-sizing the environment, um, using transient clusters to dedicate you know, optimal resources to each of those uh, groups of jobs that I mentioned you need to classify. Um, are one of those things that you need to uh, do in order to get to that optimal state after you migrate. Um, other things such as 
um, using managed scaling, auto scaling, um, or even leveraging S3 intelligent tiring, right? That will be another optimization that you can leverage. Um, or something as simple as leveraging the EMR runtime. For example, at the EA, just by running their jobs on, a, on the EMR runtime, they were able to achieve, on average, 45% better performance across all the jobs. Now, that is a similar you know, percentage of savings because, as you know, the quicker a job runs, um, the less you pay for it. And finally, the uh, last tip is to, and, and I cannot say this uh, or highlight this more, evolve your platform as your business grows. Um, I've seen customers move to a new platform, um, regardless of the technology, and then not touch it for years until the maintenance overhead, cost, or limitations become so big that a new migration is urgently required, right? And that urgency um, impacts proper planning and design. So when you move to a service like Amazon EMR, you will get access, continuous access, to a stream of new features as we at Edward US innovate. So here you will see some of the recommendations, for example, at the infrastructure level that you can leverage to continuously evolve your platform. For example, uh, leveraging Graviton instances at the infrastructure level to optimize that price performance ratio. Or enabling managed scaling, uh, things that you can do really with almost a flip of a switch, right? Enabling ma managed scaling or moving to EMR serverless. Or things that may require a little bit more effort on your end, like modernizing the data lake using one of these open table formats, such as uh, Apache Iceberg. Or integrating the platform with the, re with the rest of your analytics landscape uh, using you know, better data governance processes. So if there is just, just uh, a bunch of things that you can take home today from, from the session, please make sure that these five tips, in particular this one, is, is one of them. Um, this is all that, that we wanted to share with you all today. Remember, this, is, um, this was um, an analytics superhero session. So if you scan this QR code, you will get access to the rest of the uh, analytics-related sessions that we got this week. And you also have this, obviously, available in your uh, session catalog at reInvent. So thank you very much. Um, please complete the survey on your mobile app for the session. And I think we may have time for one or two questions. So feel free to ask any questions. If not, the three of us will be outside um, answering any question that you may have. Thank you very much.